years at Forrester Research. I was on the customer experience team and I led Forrester Group research on customer experience design and innovation. Um, before that, I uh, really have had design as the red thread through my entire career. So uh, I started designing and developing websites back in 1995. I actually, um, before it uh, became no longer uh, an <coughs> internship at at and Bell Labs, I created what I believe was the world's first social shopping application. Um, obviously just a, a, a prototype that I hacked together over um, the period of a, a few weeks over the summer, but um, really great experience for me. And then I ended up managing uh, a web design development team at a dot-com that no longer exists. So um, my, my experience really goes back to um, uh, Silicon Valley and, uh, and probably experiences that uh, I'm sure a lot of us in the room share together. So um, uh, more recently, uh, I wrote a book, uh, co-authored a book called Outside In, The Power of Putting Customers at the Center of Your Business. Um, as a little incentive for you to stay until I'm done talking, um, I've got two copies of the book that we are going to raffle off, sign them, um, but if you want to stay till the end of the q and I'm also happy to um, personalize them for you. Uh, and so, uh, and then for the past five years, uh, very, very close to the five year mark, um, I was just talking uh, with Jim, he was asking if I was going to have a celebration for this. Um, probably not, but uh, coming up on my five year anniversary of having my own company, creatively called Carrie Bodine and Company. And uh, we focus on helping uh, organizations um, of really of all sizes, but a lot of uh, large. Uh, national global organizations understand their customers' needs and expectations better so that they can create experiences that are going to be better and hopefully uh, drive business growth for them. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of my philosophy around that. Um, but I want to start out uh, really just talking about what the heck customer experience is. Um, I know all of you um, come from a product management background. Um, and this is not meant to be uh, condescending in any way. Um, I'm sure a lot of you work uh, and uh, in, in related to customer experience or are focused on customer experience in some way, shape, or form in your jobs. But even when I'm speaking to a room of people who have customer experience in their title, I always start out with these definitions of customer experience um, because I find that it's just a, a really great, great way to level set and uh, make sure we're all on the same page for what I'm going to be talking about. Um, the other thing is, I would love for this to be an interactive conversation. A lot of what I'm going to be sharing tonight is some uh, new research that I'm doing and uh, really kind of the form, uh, uh, forming strategy uh, and foundation for where I'm going to be kind of pivoting uh, my own firm and the services that we're offering to our clients. And so you will see very soon that there are a lot of relationships to what I'm talking about with journey management and product management, and I would love your feedback on where you see similarities, where you see differences, and letting me know the overlaps that you see. What, what are things that you're already doing in your product management job to focus on the journey, um, to focus on the customer experience, because that'll help me really round out um, my understanding of uh, this and how I'm talking about it and giving advice to other uh, organizations. So. Um, I, I certainly am, uh, I'm, a, I'm an expert in customer experience, but I'm not an expert in journey management stuff yet. Uh, I plan to be uh, this time next year, um, but I have a lot to learn from all of you as well this evening. So with that longer than I anticipated preamble, um, here's my uh, first definition of customer experience. So customer experience, um, when we're thinking about this from the company point of view, this is thinking of customer experience as a discipline, very much like product management or marketing or um, engineering or whatever it is, um, customer experience as a discipline is the design and management of customer interactions. It's really that simple. Um, but the, the two words here that are important to me are design and management. Um, so first of all, customer experience professionals need to figure out what should the entire experience of interacting with the organization, what should that look like? And then they have to manage the whole organization to make sure 
that it is in fact delivering on that vision. So design and management of customer interaction. So when we think about customer experience though, we're, we're often, and when you, when you hear the term um, out there in the media or, or you know, even talking about it within your organizations, um, we're often not talking about the discipline of customer experience um, and people's jobs, but we're talking about what do customers experience. And so from the customer point of view, um, this is by definition of customer experience, customers' perception, perceptions, thoughts, and feelings about their interactions with an organization. So their perceptions, thoughts, and feelings about their interactions with the organization. And these perceptions and these thoughts and these feelings, feelings, these are things that we have not been comfortable talking about in the business world until fairly recently. Um, but that is changing. Um, there's lots of great books out there that, um, and, and thought leaders in behavioral economics and in all kinds of adjacent areas, um, psychology, helping us understand that um, our emotions, our feelings are actually um, our main drivers, whether we like it or not, whether we think of ourselves as rational decision makers. Um, the, the feelings that we have um, are, are really key to how we are making decisions. Um, about anything from uh, you know what shoes we buy to where we want to work and, and everything in between. So companies have to pay attention to these you know, perceptions, thoughts, and feelings. And there are some ways that we can start to track now how well companies are actually doing that. And one of the ways that we can track this, um, there's lots of different companies that do all kinds of different rankings, um, but one that I like a lot is the American Customer Satisfaction Index. And one of the things that I like about this um, is, first of all, it's, it's very uh, uh, broad. It covers um, about, a, it's a couple hundred uh, large brands that we all do business with on a daily basis. Um, and they, they create the study by going out and surveying um, about 80,000 people across the US, asking them um, different <coughs> questions, uh, creating essentially based on their answers a list from those with the very best customer experience, top customer satisfaction, to those with the very worst. And this list is interesting because it not only provides a way to gauge any individual company's competitiveness um, within their industry, um, but we can also use this, uh, this uh, index, and especially looking at it historically, to predict future financial performance. So here's where things get interesting. So uh, what the folks at the um, ACSI did is they first plotted out the S&P 500. So that is uh, the black line that's at the bottom of this slide. And essentially, pretend I'm a comedian here. Um, essentially what you're looking at is uh, if you had invested $100 in April of 2000, at the end of 2016, and unfortunately this is the most recent data that we've been able to get from uh, the organization, um, but at the end of 2016, it would have been worth $157. And uh, so, you know, you made some money on that investment. Um, not a lot, but you know, you're able to take your family out for maybe pizza, throw in a couple beers, something like that. Um, maybe not. Not until you know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> not in San Francisco or I do. Um, okay, so what I really want to talk about, and the S&P 500 here is just uh, here for a comparison, um, but the blue line is what the folks at the ACSI call the long short portfolio. And this is essentially a portfolio that is um, guided, uh, the investment strategy is guided by the customer experience index that they have. And so essentially, the, the long part of the portfolio is they take the companies that are publicly traded and they have um, the very top customer experience scores and they take long positions on those companies. So um, they are essentially betting on the financial future of those companies. And then, you know where this is going, the companies at the bottom of the list, those are the very worst customer satisfaction, worst customer experience scores, they take short positions on, betting against their financial future. 
So with both lines here, we've got $100 initial investment with the S&P 500. We saw it's worth $157. For the long short portfolio, how much do you think your initial $100 investment using that guidance based on a customer experience based investment strategy, how much do you think that would be worth at the end of 2016? A thousand. A thousand? Yeah. 2,000? 2,000? 2,500? Price is right. Did anyone not think that much? Anyone think much higher or much lower? Is that a log scale? <laughs> nope. All right. Well, you guys are uh, not far off in terms of just order of magnitude. Um, so yeah, it would have been worth seven hundred and sixty dollars at the end of that uh, sixteen-year period. So what's interesting about this to me is that it doesn't matter if you work for a publicly traded company or not. Uh, the types of drivers, uh, the, the, the factors that are driving this type of financial performance are available to any company. They're available to Amazon, they're available to my very small consulting firm. Um, because happy customers buy more, they tell their friends, uh, who then buy and hopefully buy more because they've had a good experience. So we track revenue growth as a key outcome of customer experience performance. Um, and if you're working for a company or an industry that um, maybe revenue isn't such a big factor and you're probably all going like, hey, we work in Silicon Valley, how is revenue not a factor? We work with utility companies, things like that, um, where uh, it may not be so much about um, driving growth through additional spend, but it could be about cutting costs. And that is equally um, as important and as effective um, because happy customers also contact customer support reps because there are fewer issues that need to be resolved. So um, that's really what's driving what you're seeing there on this slide. Any comments or questions before I... Who's managing that portfolio? Yeah, so this was an actual portfolio, um, but the people managing it have discontinued it for reasons I don't understand because it seemed like it was going pretty well for them. Um, maybe that's why they haven't released more recent data, but I, I can't imagine anything had, that, that's changed in the market. There was a blip um, in the data around 2013, um, uh, but uh, you can see that this carried on after that. So I'm not really sure, not really sure what happened. Everyone else started talking about the strategy. Yeah. It could be. I told my financial advisor, I'm like, you need to look at this. I sent him a copy of my book. I was like, look on page. <laughs> they probably said everyone's got a system. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, so I'm not sure if they release all of that publicly. You may have to purchase that um, data from them. If you think your company might be on it, I'm sure they would be happy to sell it to you. <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of why they do it. Yeah, and there's lots of other companies. Forrester, um, you know, has its own ranking. Uh, there, there's lots of different companies uh, that, that do this type of thing. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Did most of that gain come from the longs or the shorts? You know what? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, so uh, in outside in. Uh, we, uh, when I was at Forrester, uh, Forrester had the uh, had the index essentially showing who the leaders and the, and the laggards were. And um, I don't know why someone at Forrester never did this um, uh, analysis, but there was a company called Watermark Consulting, and they were like, "Well, we're going to do the financial analysis on the stock price of these leaders and laggards because we make them public." And um, honestly, it was so long that the book. So long ago. The book came out in 2012, um, so the, the data is just not fresh in my mind. Um, but there were there were significant gains by the leaders and significant losses by the laggards as well. So it was it was definitely both, and I would imagine um, that would be similar to how it is now. There there was at one point where the the laggards were definitely losing a lot, and then they started losing less and less and less over over as the, they tracked this over time, but. I would say it's, it's a combination of both. So I'm willing, I'm willing to bet there's another avenue that can be used to do this now that they've sent in. It's the book called Everybody Live that talks, it's a Google data scientist talks mm -hmm. about what searches show. Mm 
charts that look like this. Um, our executive teams want to know all the numbers that are going on all the time. And in fact, I think we spend um, just an enormous amount of time in our organizations uh, focused on the numbers. This is not meant to be a scientifically accurate uh, number. All that data you couldn't come up with really. I, I know, I know. I'm kind of, kind of breaking the rules here. But um, the fact of the matter is our organizations tend to be so, so heavily focused and um, not nearly focused enough on this. And you can't really see this um, very well on here, but it's a lovely video of lovely people, um, and some of them are enjoying themselves and some of them are struggling. Um, but it's a video that I like to show that really just kind of brings the humanness out of uh, the experiences that, that people are having. Um, they're using some website um, of some sort um, <laughs> while, they're, while they're being filmed here. Um, and so my message to organizations is not at all to flip this equation. I don't want them focused 5% on numbers and 95% on people's feelings. Um, but my goal is to try to bring these things more into balance. And that doesn't ne necessarily need to be a 50-50 balance. Um, a healthy balance could be 70-30 or 80-20 or any, anything in between, depending on the organization. But the fact of the matter is that we have to start paying more attention to people's perceptions, their thoughts, and their emotions. And this is where the concept of the customer journey comes in. And it really helps us to do that. So the customer journey, when, when we think about just kind of the, the basic building blocks of the journey, Customer journey is a set of steps that customers take as they try to accomplish a goal or a task. So it's very simple. Customers are trying to do something and we're trying to support them in that, that mission that they've got. And so um, uh, this may sound similar to different frameworks that you've got and, and you use, jobs to be done or, or whatever that is. Um, but I really like to think about this as someone is uh, waking up in the morning and they're making their mental to-do list and that could be related to their work or it could be related to their personal lives um, and it's those things that go on the to-do list um, that turn into things that that end up being journeys when we think about um, their relationship with the company so um, uh, let me show you a little bit more what I mean when I'm talking about a journey this is what I call the archetypal customer journey and um, and by the way, I see you all taking, or not you all, but several people taking pictures, which is fantastic, and feel free to tweet and do whatever um, you want to with them, but I will give you a link also at the end of the presentation where you can download the slides. Um, so if you want to save a little space on your phone, <laughs> then uh, that might help you. Um, so the archetypal customer journey, I created this because um, people were asking me, well, well, what journeys should we map and where should we get started? And how does a journey relate to the customer life cycle? And so um, the, cu the customer journey, I would say, first of all, is related to the customer life cycle. Um, you'll, as I walk you through this, you'll see things uh, that sound similar to parts of uh, a life cycle diagram that your, your marketing teams would use. Um, but there's a difference here in that uh, this journey has an end, and we'll talk specifically about the end piece of it, the, the leaving portion of this. Um, life cycle journeys, or, or sorry, customer life cycle diagrams, they're circular, right? They don't have an end to them, and that's because marketers are delusional that your customers are <laughs> always going to be with your organization. Um, lots of other people in your organization are delusional about that as well. Um, the end of the journey is the most overlooked part of the journey. Uh, and I love marketers, but uh, I also like to pick on them. Uh, so, uh, so let me just walk you through these steps here, and then um, uh, I'm happy to, to stop and answer any questions that you have. So your customers start out, and they have some need. 
uh, they need something, uh, their boss just told them that they need to um, go out and purchase some software for the team, or they've gotten an invitation to a wedding and they need to go out and buy a new pair of shoes or you know, whatever it is. Um, they've got some need. They then seek out solutions. They choose solution, one or more solutions. Uh, it could be a product, it could be a service, whatever it is. And I've got this kind of diverging and then converging. Um, as we get to the give get, this is kind of the, the core of the value exchange. Someone is giving something in exchange for something else. And I used to have this part labeled buy get, um, but the reality is that for a lot of businesses, things are being exchanged there that are not money for goods or services. People are giving information in exchange for other information. Um, people are giving their time, people are giving a vote, um, lots of different things that people could be giving for, for getting something in return. Then we get into the kind of this big wheel, and this is where your customers are using your products or services, and as needed, they are fixing any problems that may arise. It could be a problem with the billing, it could be a problem with the product or, or service itself. Lots of different things can happen. And then at the end of the journey, your customers either love you and they return to some other part of this journey, do more business with you. That's the part that the marketers love. But at some point, your customers are going to leave you. This is a fact. We have not solved the problem of human mortality yet, but your customers will leave you one way or another. Sometimes when your customers leave you, there is another customer that comes in and takes its place. So think about an insurance company um, with a, a life insurance product. A, a life insurance policy holder dies, there's a beneficiary who then becomes um, the new customer and needs to start interacting. So when we think about this, the leaving part is really important. And, and, and yeah, sometimes this actually involves death, um, but sometimes this just means someone is canceling their subscription. Maybe they're unsubscribing from all the emails they're getting from you. Maybe um, it's just, I have completed this shopping trip and I am walking out of the store and I am done um, for, for this particular journey that I'm on. Um, but this leaving part is so overlooked. We all want to focus on the beginning parts of this. When, we, when we're thinking about the funnel, we want to get people into the funnel, right? Your customers don't care about funnels, right? They don't care about awareness and all this. That's the other thing that makes this different. All of these words are from the perspective of the customer, right? There's no awareness, there's no consideration, there's no choice reduction. Um, these are things that people want to do. And this leaving, this is really important. When you think about, um, I, I like to compare this to uh, having a romantic relationship or a friendship and you've broken up. Um, and how that breakup goes, whether or not you were kind to each other, whether or not there were any words said, whether or not you felt respected, can make a difference as to whether or not you want to be friends with that person or even consider maybe getting back together someday. And so this leaving part is, is really essential. And I know I hammer on that a lot, um, but it's because it is so woefully uh, neglected in terms of the overall experience. So it's, do you know the story about Disney? Um, Disney is, is obsessive about the last memory that you have at the park. So people get so excited when they show up at Disney, they do a lot of silly things. They forget where they park, bother to turn off their car, they lock their car with the keys inside, and so on. So for example, they devised a whole lot of mechanisms specifically to make sure that your last memory is positive. So when you show up and you're like, I don't remember where my car is, they said, when did you show up? 9.30? During Mickey J. Oh, you don't have any, you can't get into your car? We've got some person on a runabout that can open your car, it has gas, it has a battery pack or whatever. So that at the very end, it all turned out okay. It's an interesting story for you, but it wasn't a disaster. Yeah. Well, and this, uh, if you've heard of Daniel Kahneman and the peak end rule, um, it relates directly to uh, the idea of the journey. So, um, so what his research showed and what the peak end rule is essentially saying is that what people remember are their peak experience and the end experience. 
And so the peak doesn't necessarily mean the, the best part of it. It could be the very worst part of it, but it, it's essentially the most extreme piece, the extreme part of the journey or experience. And then they remember the last thing, just as you were saying. So I'm sure this is where Disney gets this and why they focus on it. What's really interesting is that um, the peak end rule research originated from uh, a study of people getting colonoscopies. And, um, and what they found that was... Is <laughs> Having a peak in the end, I love it. Um, so what they found was that um, it didn't matter um, how much pain people reported throughout, it didn't matter how long the procedure was, how people rated their perceptions of the procedure mattered just on the, the worst part of it and the, and the very last thing that happened. And so, um, and that, that research has um, expanded to um, many other things now, but yes, so. Uh, our, our memories are, are very uh, attached to the most extreme things and then the last thing that happens. There's also the primacy, recency effect and things like that. So uh, lots goes into that. So one other thing I wanna say about this um, archetypal customer journey is that um, these are meant to be building blocks. So every journey may not have um, all of these different components in it. If you're looking at a journey of someone um, contacting your support team for a question, and then your support team uh, uh, somehow in that encourages them to renew their subscription um, uh, to the service or, or something like that, you might be looking at just the kicks and beloved parts of the journey, right? So not every journey has to go through all of these. Um, and then the other thing is that um, these can happen in different orders. I've kind of got them linearly uh, lined up here. Um, but give get, just as one example here, if you go to a uh, certain type of restaurant, you are going to give your money and then get your food. If you go to another type of restaurant, you're going to get your food and then give your money. Uh, so uh, again, just think of these as, as building blocks. Any questions on, on this and, and thinking about how to, how to think about what customers are going through, the, the goals that they have, the tasks that they're trying to accomplish, and putting it into uh, a framework to, to help you think about uh, what a journey might look like. So, when you're talking about the fix part, mm -hmm. is that from the customer viewpoint that they're fixing something as it relates to the experience of the product, or as opposed to the entity that's providing the product or service fixing something that's wrong with it? This is all from the customer's perspective, that the customer is trying to fix something. Um, so I have a, uh, for my Mac, um, I have a trackpad, and one of the little rubber feet comes off of it, but when the rubber foot comes off, it stops working. So I need to get that fixed. Like, so that's, that's the thing. Um, I have signed up for, let me just say, like a new gym service or something like that. I'm not quite sure how the billing is supposed to work. Um, that, that's me fixing something. I've got some kind of question in my mind um, that I, like I've already signed up for it, so it's, it's, not, it's not part of me making my decision, you know, finding out like how much it costs and questions about that would be there, but like, oh, like I think maybe you didn't charge me or you overcharged me or I'm not quite sure when I'm gonna be charged next, that would be going in. Yeah, so, so your question is essentially, how do you, how do you play whack-a-mole um, with, with all the different customer issues? Um, I think the journey is a fantastic framework for doing that because you are looking at issues as they come in within the context of a broader task that someone's trying to do. Um, I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna put a 
So I'm going to hit pause on that question um, for just a moment and come back to it when I show you um, a couple of journey maps, if that's okay, just to talk about it a little bit more concretely. Okay, yes? So um, my question is about the, the population size that you would, the range you recommend, like what's the minimum number of people, you know, there's the debate sort of between quantitative and qualitative research yeah. and this being more, much more on the qualitative side. Mm -hmm. And then where would you say the max? And let's say you don't know what your testing segmentation is at all, mm -hmm. and it's the first time you're doing this. What would you recommend on how you get to the right test? I am all about the scientific method, and so creating a hypothesis for who you think your customer segmentation is, um, and then going out and doing some research and seeing if the research um, confirms or conflicts with your hypothesis. Um, so. Uh, I'm also a fan of combining qualitative and quantitative research methods. Um, so when we do uh, a customer, uh, when we do research, qual the qualitative part of the research to inform customer journey mapping, we're often doing it with around 20 to 30 subjects um, who come to a workshop and we might supplement that with another uh, 30 or so people that we do one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews with um, or a diary study or something like that. Um, and so that's a very small number of subjects. Um, but what you get by taking the time to really talk with people, and when we do our customer workshops, this is a whole other talk, so I'm gonna try and answer this as succinctly and you know, I'm happy to answer more questions afterwards. Um, but we actually bring, bring our clients' customers in for an entire day, it's like five or six hours that they're with us. So we're really listening to them. We're really getting them uh, to tell us their stories. And not just like, hey, I want you to build an XYZ community, but like, okay, why? What, what like internal need do you have that's driving you to say you want X, Y, or Z? And so you, you, get, you get these stories um, that you couldn't possibly get through quantitative data, either through looking at analytics or looking uh, by doing a survey or something like that. Um, and so, so again, it's a combination. You, you do research with a small number of customers. Um, you find some deep insights that you wouldn't have gotten through a quant uh, research method, and, but then you go out and validate it through quant as well. Can I ask a little bit of follow-up? Sure. So if, could you completely skip all the like focus study questions and just do diary observation studies? Sure. Um, for me, uh, so so I think of diary and observation uh, as kind of two different flavors of the same type of thing. So observational research um, is going out and actually following someone around for a day or however long, um, and then the diary study is a way to do that. Um, in a less time and resource intensive way. So there's lots of apps, B-Scout and Demo, things like that, that you can use to um, uh, essentially just ping them throughout a period of time or get them to record whenever they're doing X, Y, or Z type of activity. Um, and so it's, again, it's just a more cost-effective way of doing the observational research. So yeah, you could definitely do that. Um, when you're doing if you're doing a remote, when, whenever we do remote diary studies, we always pair them with an interview so that we can ask follow-up questions. Um, because what you really want are people's stories. Um, and, I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but what you, you're not gonna get someone's story if they're just like sending you a few pictures or things like that, or even a video clip or two. Um, uh, when you're doing observational research and you're actually going and following someone around, you're going to get them to tell your story throughout the day. No observational research is pure observation, um, so you would get that. So yeah, it's you can you can choose different different research methods. But for me, the most important part for the the core building block that then you want to validate, further validate with quantitative research. But the core uh, kind of research um, outputs that you're looking for are customer stories. Um, so let me give you one example. We were working with a grocery store chain and um, they wanted to know about uh, the, the shopping experience. And there was a guy um, who uh, was telling us that we, we actually were targeting uh, lower income people 
Um, and they have very different populations who, who worked at the grocery store, you know, headquarters in the grocery store, so they, they really had trouble relating to them. Um, and, and there was a guy in there who was saying, um, yeah, you know, uh, the manager's special is, is really an amazing uh, part of the shopping experience. And, and the people who work for the grocery store, the manager's special, like, that's the meat that we have to throw away tomorrow if we don't sell it today because it's about to go off. Um, and uh, another woman chimed in and said, yeah, but that's the only time I can afford to buy my family steak is if it's on the manager special. And this other guy chimes in and he's like, yeah, you know, I walk into the store and I go back to the meat counter and I see, you know, what the manager special is. And it's like, shit, we're having pork chops for dinner tonight. <laughs> and he's telling the story and he's, and he's like animated like this. And everyone's like, yeah, you know, and, and it's like, you're not going to get that from a survey. You're not going to get that if someone just like shows you a picture and is like, hey, yeah, we're having pork chops. You know, it's like having these, having the, the conversation with someone and eliciting those stories, that's what really helps you to, to understand the journey um, and their needs and expectations and how you can better meet those. Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, touch a little bit more on the storytelling piece of this. So I'll come back to both of your questions in, uh, in some different ways. Um, so I just want to also uh, talk a little bit about why the framework of the journey is so important. Um, and the first reason is that the journey is greater than the sum of its parts. So uh, the story that I have here comes from McKinsey. Um, there's a, 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 the name of an article that you can find online um, where they tell the story in a little bit more detail, but essentially they were working with a media company and the media company, I think I can say who it was, but I'm assuming it's someone like Verizon or Comcast, and they were looking at the onboarding journey. So someone had signed up for service and then they needed to get it like actually installed at their house. And so when they would survey um, customers at each individual touch point, they had about a 90% chance of getting it right. So every phone call, every technician visit to the house, um, every website visit, you, know, you name it, mobile, mobile interaction, everything's going great. However, there were about nine different phone calls during this journey. Um, one on-site visit from a technician, multiple website visits, emails, um, and this journey spanned about three months. And so when uh, they surveyed people about their satisfaction of the journey, not of the individual touch points, but of the journey, their satisfaction was about 40% lower. Okay, so doesn't matter how good your website is, how good your mobile app is, how much you've optimized customer support or your truck rolls or whatever it is, we need to be thinking about the things that customers are trying to do. I'm trying to get this thing set up. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So the follow-on to this is that it's journeys and not individual touch points that predict business success. And this data also comes from McKinsey. It's, um, uh, this first data is a little bit wonky. Um, some of you um, may have some stats degrees uh, or, or stats backgrounds uh, for the work that you do. Um, but uh, I'm not going to get into this into too much detail, but what you're looking at here are R-squared values. Does anyone know what an R-squared value is? Oh my god, I love this group. This never happens. Um, so I actually had to talk with a friend who was getting a PhD in political science and make sure that I was talking about this in the right way. I took one stats class in college. Um, but essentially, um, R-squared values are uh, the outputs of a multiple regression analysis. I think I said that almost correctly. Yeah, that's good enough. It's close, it's, close it's enough. Take more the grain of salt. Okay. They don't tell you as much as you think they will. Okay. Well, these are R squared values um, uh, for blue. Uh, in the, for the, the blue is for journeys, and the uh, green lines are the R squared va R squared values for touch points. Um, so the blue lines uh, are longer than the green lines. That's what I want you to get out of this slide. And uh, the uh, blue lines are ranging from uh, 56 to 117% uh, uh, greater value um, than the touch points. So essentially what this slide is showing, um, and we can argue about the stats part of this later, but um, from, from what McKinsey was trying to make a point with and the point I'm trying to make is that journeys are better, th uh, better predictors than touch points are at predicting customer satisfaction and willingness to recommend. And that was true in four different um, industries that McKinsey looked at. This 
next slide is a little bit easier to understand because we've got that those lines going up and to the right, which um, we uh, generally like to see when we're looking at uh, charts with financials in them. And uh, what this is showing is uh, average satisfaction on the x-axis, average satisfaction with companies um, in the auto insurance and pay TV industries, satisfaction with their top key uh, three journeys. So essentially for each industry, they said, what are the three key journeys that matter most? Things like onboarding or you know buying or, or whatever it was. Um, what's the satisfaction? And then what is the revenue growth rate for these companies? And so what they found was that satisfaction with key journeys correlates to growth rate. And they specifically found that a one point improvement in satisfaction on a 10 point scale corresponds to at least a three percentage point increase so we need to pay attention to journeys. Looking at individual touch points is important. It's never gonna go away. We still need to optimize the mobile app. We still need to optimize the website and everything else. But we have to be looking at how all of these touch points, including some of the redheaded stepchildren of organizations like, <laughs> sorry, like, like customer support, parts of the organization that don't often get as much love or attention as other parts do, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, they, they need to be looked at um, from the perspective of the journey and what customers are trying to do and, and how they all fit into that bigger picture. So then the next question is how can we understand customers' journeys? And this is where um, the concept of the customer journey map comes in. So how many of you have uh, know of customer journey maps? Let's take it broadly. How many of you have created a customer journey map? Okay, awesome. I wanna talk with everyone who just had their hand up because I'm very interested again in this intersection between product management and, and the journey management. Um, so if you would, like, get in contact with me after this, please, <laughs> or give me your business card. Um, so, uh, but for, for everyone in the room, journey maps are diagrams that visualize the actions, thoughts, and feelings of a person or a group over time. So diagrams that visualize the actions, thoughts, and feelings of a person or a group over time. And there's another way that I like to say this is that journey maps illustrate customer stories. And this is where we can start to bring in the qualitative and the quantitative data, bring it together um, to help people throughout the organization make better decisions. We have to have those stories, um, like the one that came from now, who we lovingly refer to as Porkchop Guy. Um, we have to have the emotional part of the story to really make it compelling, to create empathy um, with uh, for across the organization for customers really help people relate to customers and what they're going through. But we do want to bring in quantitative pieces of data as well to help reinforce the story and help people understand how the story is important to the business. Okay, so I want to show you a couple of examples of uh, journey maps, um, and I'm just going to show you two. Um, but this one I love. Um, can anyone read what's on here? Dutch. Y yes? Yeah. You speak Dutch? No, but I speak enough German and English to work it out. Okay, yeah. Does anyone in the room speak Dutch? I don't speak Dutch either. And yes, we can work out a few things. We can see the word station here. Um, there's a few words that you can make out. But what's really great about this diagram is that we can actually make out some parts of what's happening in this customer journey, even without speaking Dutch. So we've got this um, big green arrow at the top, customer journey map, that's showing our timeline going from left to right. That's a very common element of a, a journey map. We've got um, different steps uh, that people are going on. We can see some different um, uh, icons. There's a, a, a light bulb where someone has gotten an idea. We've got a bike, some music, footsteps. Looks like a train or a bus up there. Um, so get some idea that this is a transportation related journey. Yep. We also see things on here, I'm sure you've noticed. We've got green happy faces. We've got 
red frowny faces. We've got parts of this that have a mix of those so we can see what parts of the journey are going well, what's not, where there's, again, kind of a mix of good and bad things happening. And then one other thing that might be um, a little bit hard to see, but over here, there is a picture of someone and it says a nook. And so this is the person who is going through this journey. And this is really important, and this gets back to your question, Lou, about thinking about segmentation and, uh, and who's going through the journey. But you really need to have a description. And I don't know if you use personas um, in your organization, who's your work, but if you've got personas, you wanna think about attaching a persona to a journey map because we need to know who is going through the journey. We need a description of pork chop guy in order to be able to relate to pork chop guy and what he's going through in his journey. And that description, of course, is not just a description of pork chop guy. It's a description that encompasses research um, and, and insights from a group of people like pork chop guy. Um, but we really need to understand who's going through this because with any, with any, um, you know. Uh, any single industry, any company, um, a customer of one type or one profile is gonna have very different needs and expectations um, than customers of a different profile. So, so that is a really important thing um, to, to keep in mind. And um, yeah, if you don't have any segmentation, um, I've got some guidelines for how to start thinking about it, but I just don't have time to go through it this evening, but I'd be happy to send those to you. I've got a blog post. So any questions or comments about this, <coughs> excuse me, as a journey map? Are you going to talk about the translation of the journey map into some special font and details, like the features? Not in terms of going to features, no. Um, uh, but tell, tell me more, tell me more about what. Well, so I've done a few journey maps, and mm -hmm. I think the hardest part about them was not generating the journey map, it was actually generating the results from it and then translating it to you know where those friction points are and to solutions that then have the maximum impact and that seemed like the, the few times that the downstream was the hardest part of, of getting of getting the value out of it was the interpretation of the features and the map. Yeah. Do you do you have the something yeah, to build on that? Yeah. A whole lot of what's been talked about so far is very analogous to writing user stories. So, translating from a journey map into some user stories. I'm a user who's, I'm a person who's trying to get across town. I make my plan, I go, I'm happy when I hear the news came to town, et cetera, but here's where this waiting period right in the middle is where I've got a, a flat spot. So something that could make that better is gonna make me happy. And therefore, having that conversation with the developer saying, what can we do about that waiting period? How can we improve that situation, et cetera? So it leads to, uh, a clear user story that translates into a feature or a, a bullet point. Yeah. Maybe I can take my um, one step further. It was, it's, it was more around like, so let's say you do that and then you have, on this map for example, you have 20 or 30 different things you can do. Mm -hmm. You have to prioritize them. You could say, okay, the ones with the highest friction points are the, the red frowning faces is where you want to go. But you need to pick a few of those to then do some quantitative research to validate it, but you're taking, at that point you're still taking a guess, right? It's still based on, so how do you go through that? Let me take the temporal question that is the one that actually counts for the data index. And is there a way to, to sort of validate or say like through a couple of case studies or other things that you can justify prioritizing based on the journey map? Yeah, same, 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 same topic. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. So some journey maps will actually show the pain points or the uh, happy moments with sizes of circles. So like, you'll see the impact to that is sometimes indica indicates like the amount or the number of users that had that friction point. So that helps with prioritization a little bit as well. Um, Cause then it's easier to see on your journey map where the opportunities, a, a key thing of journey maps typically too is for what you're saying, having that opportunities lined up with each of those pain points and touch points so that you know where to focus from a product perspective. Because if everything is the same, nothing is important, right? And you want to know from the customer's perspective, like you're saying, yeah, exactly, which we've got there showing the Yeah, path. so so um, 
I'm going to say right now, journey maps are not a panacea for, for helping you to make every last decision that you need to make. Um, I often talk about the fact that journey maps are diagnostic and not prescriptive. Um, and so they're going to help you understand where to focus and prioritize. And again, to your point, this is where the qualitative and the quantitative come together. I really like this journey map um, that comes from Intuit, and I'm not going to get into the details of it. Um, but uh, up here is good and down is bad. The degree of up is the degree of good. The degree of down is the degree of bad. Um, but one other thing that they've got here is um, they've got, it's really hard to see, but there's kind of a gray person, uh, and it's, it's getting grayed out as it falls off a cliff. Um, and so these are customer drop-off points. And so uh, they don't have it truly at a quantitative level. They're not saying this is how, um, how many customers are dropping off at these three points, but they're at least saying, hey, these are three drop-off points, or at least they didn't on the one that they shared publicly <laughs> um, with, the, with the rest of the world. Um, and so you could say, okay, if we didn't have the, the business side of this, the quantitative side, you could just say, oh, well, let's fix the biggest pain point. But actually, <laughs> up here early on in the journey, there's a part of the journey that isn't so terrible, but there is actually customer drop-off here. So this may be something that we want to solve for. But again, there's not necessarily going to be all the information that you need to solve for this on the map. However, I would argue that that's a good thing because, again, going back to what I said about customer journey maps illustrate customer stories. What we're trying to do is use this as, as a story to unite the organization, unite different parts of the organization around the things that we should be fixing. We want to be including information in here, and I'll enlarge this one particular step here, um, where it says she's worried. And then it lists all the things she's worried about. I wonder if they got my facts. Do I need to be near my computer? I'm not sure what to expect. I wonder if the pro will phone at the exact appointment time. Do I have everything I need? Because we are helping the organization to understand the customer's thoughts and emotions, their perceptions, their needs, their expectations, we can give this map to people across the organization. We can give this to a marketing team, we can give this to an engineering team, to a customer support team, um, to people who are responsible for any given channel, and they can all start to identify solutions that they could potentially be responsible for for improving the experience. Now, how exactly should that you know, part of the website or you know, whatever it is, you know, a, a conversation over chat how exactly should that be designed or, or, or implemented in order to meet these needs? That's a, that's a design process to me. That, that's something that comes after this. But this is meant to help, getting back to your, your question from earlier, take some of those, uh, what can sometimes feel like random pieces of feedback and put them into a greater context of what you understand customers are needing based on not what they're trying to do specifically on you know, screen three of your particular product flow, but what they're trying to do overall and what their questions are about it and you know, what, they're, what, what they are really needing or expecting from it. So, so again, this is, this is meant to be a tool to help facilitate broader understanding um, and make decisions that are not done in a, uh, in, a, in a small kind of narrow way, but really to open up the conversation and make sure that everything that we're putting into place is going to work for this particular customer and their needs. Yes? Yeah. Just one thing, too. I, I'm thinking in my mind, so, um, so I work on a, a website. A big thing, and I can certainly see the applicability of this in sort of a journey, not only across the entirety of the experience, but also even particular sets of the experience. Um, in my mind, I'm trying to sort of figure out where the cutoff point ends up, where this this stops being a useful tool, because that's always one of the things I look for in tools, is like, where to apply this, but more importantly, where not to apply it. 
it seems to me like once you get down to maybe maybe feature level is not the right term, but like like if you're the product manager who's solely about like the weight and the waiting step, or like that you're one block in there, uh, it's useful to have the map and the experience as a whole, but like the individual item, that's kind of a level of fidelity of resolution beyond which you're not gonna be able to get something out of this, but I'm not, I'm not sure if that's right or wrong. Yeah, I, uh, so I, I totally agree with you. Um, uh, so, so I have a couple of different uh, responses to that. So the, the first is that, um, so I bet there is no product manager for weight, right? So, so that's part of what that's part of what this is revealing, right? Like there's there's a period of like three days or maybe it's six weeks or something where she's just like, dude, you're like you were telling me about the story of your door, right? And like four weeks later, you're like, what the hell happened? Like I thought he was gonna get back to me, you know, five days later, and I haven't heard from him, right? There is no one at Home Depot or at the door manufacturer who is responsible for that waiting period, right? So. So that's part of what this helps to reveal. But this is um, uh, uh, an online chat, right? So there, there is probably someone responsible for that, but they need to understand what comes next, what came before, in order to, to be able to make the whole experience, not optimize the individual touch points, but optimize the whole experience. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a the whole journey. There's a statement that's a, attributed to Bezos about like, um, Amazon's very focused on data and analytics kind of thing and things like that, but uh, there's kind of this check on that whole philosophy, which is if, when given anecdotes and data, and the anecdotes disagree with the data, go with the anecdotes. Mm -hmm. and, and it's more about like, yeah, you may have all these silos of metrics, but there's maybe a gap within them that doesn't cover this experiential piece, and that's what the anecdote, the story, the emotion, yeah. the thing you're talking about yeah. speak to that are missing in the silo. I can tell you the grocery store had no idea that the manager special was actually a delighter for their customers. Poor pork guy. Yeah, they, and they have a lot of, a lot of pork chop guy uh, uh, customers. So let me just say one other thing about um, uh, getting down the feature level. Um, going back to the fact that, that these customer journey maps are about illustrating customer stories. Uh, one of the things about stories is that well, we need to have a protagonist, right? So this, this particular map, I don't think does a good job of helping us understand really who is going through this journey. What, you know, what, what's her financial situation? How complex are her investments? Because she hasn't earned taxes before, that type of thing. However, um, there's other things I obviously really like about this map. Um, but another thing that you need to think about when you're telling a story is who is the audience? And so there are journey maps at different levels of detail. There are some journey maps that I've seen that do get into an excruciating level of detail, but they kind of cease to be functional journey maps for me at that point. There's so much data piled on. And they might actually be more useful for you as a product manager to start getting at um, you know, more feature level type detail, but they're probably gonna make the whole rest of the organization there are other journey maps that I've seen. Uh, there's a great one from LinkedIn that I was, I was going to use in this presentation, but I think it's fine to get it out. But it is, it's essentially, it goes blue and then red, and then it kind of comes up. And there's very, it's about the sign up process for someone signing up for a profile and filling out their profile the first time. There's very, very little data on it. There's um, a few quotes about people being frustrated or overwhelmed or whatever, but there's this, this big red, red <coughs> dip down at the bottom. And, when, when I show it, when we do workshops, and so when I show it to, um, to attendees of our workshops, they're often like, you can't make any decisions about this. And I'm like, think about who this story could be appropriate for. And what I believe um, that that journey map was intended to do was to get some executive to give them money to fix that big red dip. Red is bad. Exactly. Fix red. Right. And I think it's an incredibly effective visualization for the outcome that they wanted based on the audience that they had. And so when you when you think about journey maps, um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, I 
part of why I want to be here is like, how can we make journey maps more effective for all of you? So I, I love all these questions. And, and honestly, I don't have all the answers for all of you um, tonight. Um, but just keep in mind that the journey maps are really about uniting all the different parts of the organization. And so some stories might be um, intended for you and some might be you know, intended for other parts of your organization and other decision makers. Yes? Just wanted to make one comment as you click back one. Mm -hmm. You had talked about how even though that's the most, ex maybe one more click, yeah. If you talk about that deepest dip as yep. a place you naturally be drawn to yep. work on first and you talked about the different cliff points yep. being important to analyze. One of the reasons those earlier cliffs may be more important is the user has much less invested in the process uh, at that point than they do later on. So they may be less willing to bail later on and this, than early on. If we're thinking about a funnel perspective, yeah. the funnel's a lot fatter here. So if we that can make too. an even incremental change in that attrition rate, it can have a really big impact on the number of people going Bingo. to the next step. To your comment about like how they fit together and his question around you know like how do I go to the appropriate level of detail? Um, there's you can do journey maps for like you said different personas, which is the best practice. Um, and then what's important to do then is to look. I mean maybe you're a product manager for a specific product line, but also from a strategic perspective, you can layer those journey maps on top of each other to see where the overlaps are, so that you have a better idea of you know data that corresponds, maybe there's certain pieces that are common across all the different persona journeys, and that's an easier way to identify trends of like where strategically you might want to look at more detail or focus. I just yeah, and I think that's something that is not taken advantage of nearly enough. Um, I've seen it a handful of times, and when I say a handful, like actually probably just two or three that I can think of off the top of my head where, where actually comparing uh, the, the journeys of different personas on one map, but I, I absolutely love that um, practice, and, um, and yeah, I think it's great. The LinkedIn map actually has kind of um, four different lines on it that are all similar, um, but slightly different, and um, so the, my hypothesis about that map, because again, I found it online because I can't share maps I've created for our clients with you all here. I hope that's understandable. Um, so my hypothesis about the LinkedIn map of the different lines is that, yeah, it's different personas. So. Question over here. Yes. I'm just trying to think about, you mentioned LinkedIn, and obviously that's a big B2C business, but in general, when you're doing a very high volume web-based business, first of all, the challenge of getting people and getting them to describe their journeys um, it's along the lines of user testing, but it's very resource intensive to do, obviously. Um, and then second, can you somehow tie that with analytics tools like Google Analytics when you're constructing the journey, trying to like hypothesize what the pain points are? I'm just, you know, in the case of doing your taxes or, or B2B work that I, I do see you, it's a little easier to imagine constructing one of these than it is in, in the B2C space that I'm in now. Um, yeah, so uh, I get this question sometimes. Um, you know, there are certain certain things where if you're going to do a usability test, like you should just do a usability test and like not try to make a journey map out of the results. You know what I mean? Like if you've got certain questions that are that are getting you to do a, a usability test, like you should you should just do that. Like I'm I'm not trying to say that uh, a journey map should should be uh, uh, something that every that, that, that it's not like you know I'm, I'm, a, I'm a hammer looking for a nail right like there's there's certain things it's like yeah you just don't have a dream map I, I will tell you um, they are most useful when you are crossing channels and you are doing things that take a place over a period of time um, so there are some there are certainly some purely online or in-app uh, experiences that I you could journey map, um, but I I don't know that it's quite as useful because again one of the reasons well we I guess not again we haven't really talked about this one of the reasons journey maps are so effective it gets back to what I said about the stories we're telling stories because we're trying to unite the organization around creating a profitable experience for the customer and if we're just focused 
on one touch point, like just the website or just the app or just the you know the one product. I don't know that one team can kind of focus on that. But if what you're looking at is okay, we just sold the product and now someone needs to get onboarded and other people need to get training and then they need to start using it. Okay, well that starts to cross multiple parts of the of the, of the organization and it starts to. You know, it touches certainly on some digital touch points, but it certainly would touch on a call with account manager or whatever. So, I don't know. It, it's just I would just say, don't don't take my being here tonight to say like you have to like layer on journey map to everything that you do. I did work with a big tech company years ago where we did journey mapping of their sign up and password recovery process because it was fallacious. Um, and this was a project run by their support team um, because they needed to reduce the cost of, of um, helping people with this particular issue. Um, and what we did was we took, um, we made printouts of the different screens and then we had people put them up. So we weren't, we were still having them uh, do a task that they had done recently so they could remember. And yeah, was it exactly, you know, what they did? Probably not, but it was, you know, we gave them enough cues and prompts that they were able to put together a story. But again, even that cross channels because they were doing some stuff online and some stuff with support. Yes. One of some of my worst experiences using websites and apps is I'm I'm going through and I'm doing my thing, and then something pops up and it's like, how am I doing? You know, tell us about this website. Tell us about. <laughs> oh, and sign up for our this, newsletter. Right? They rate this app, and and yeah. that instantly just like takes me out of kind yeah. of you know the zone. So. Is that, is that related more to the, the touch points and the journey and are these things productive or, or counterproductive? Why, why do people do it? Why is it so prevalent? So, <laughs> it seems totally well, because the reasons why organizations do that is because there's such a focus on metrics. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm happy that people are getting crazy about measuring people's thoughts and emotions and reactions and they want to know what the experience is like. Uh, but to your point, they're not thinking about the surveying as part of that experience. There's actually one company out there um, that's actually trying to make it a good experience and recognizing that they're called Customer Build. Um, but but most companies like 4C, they're just like, ah, yeah, let me interrupt you and you know well, I'm telling you about someone. Else. Think about the Netflix challenge. Remember the Netflix challenge? You know, we'll give you a million bucks if you can prove our recommendation engine. Uh, I don't remember. Yeah, so the whole time. It was basically a giant challenge. Netflix improve our algorithm for recommending movies, and the um, you know what they gave you was a bunch of data around you know people rating different movies four star, five star, three star, or whatever. You know, data is data, right? A four to four, a five to five, whatever. The the breakthrough came from someone who it was a father daughter pair where I think the father was a psychologist and the daughter was a mathematical computer scientist or something like this, and the revelation was, yeah, people don't view numbers and movie ratings that way. My four and your four aren't the same. In fact, my four depends on, did I just come in and rate a four and leave? Or did I just rate a three and then rate a four? Or did I rate a bunch of fours or rate a five and a four? Those are all different numbers. And, and how does McDonald's have a Yelp score of like four and a half in university, <laughs> right? <laughs> I find that the majority of stars rating the people are positively biased. Yeah, yeah, everything is good. Even if they're not happy, they usually, one, it's really pissed them off, really. In general, people are more on the positive side, and they want to get away from this saying, yeah, yeah, good, 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 everything is excellent, excellent. But what I find that some companies do is that they want to go to the new web page or the modification, so they don't roll it out at the same time. They do in selected market, and then they see a test, and then they see, wait a minute, am I getting more, uh, whatever the metric is, sure. more sales, more uh, eyeball, or yeah. whatever, with this new design versus the old design right. or not. And it's kind of, uh, I, I find that to be much more effective of finding out what people are liking rather than having surveys or anything. Well, it's behavior rather than opinion. Exactly, it's well, a result, it's a result oriented rather so than. Uh, so this is why we, I strongly recommend that if you're gonna do journey mapping, you gotta get to people's stories, right? Because pork chop guy, there are parts of the experience that were working for him and he loved, parts that were painful, right? And, and not everything is just, 
how you know how how would I even rate this on a scale of one to five or one to seven or zero to eleven if you're doing uh, or zero to ten if you're doing net promoter score or whatever it is. So the the ratings and things are good for certain things, but those types of ratings are not going to help you build the journey map uh, or at least an effective one. And one one more question and then we're going to move on because I haven't even gotten to the main thing I wanted to talk with you guys about. We've only got like ten minutes left. So. Yeah. Sure, but I'm gonna have to come back. You're gonna have to have me back to talk about journey management in the, in the new year. Maybe a comment or question. So I think based on what you were asking, would you agree that it seems like th those methods are, are core to architecture to figuring out where you are today, and then you getting a gauge for some of these measures. But if you want, especially trying to figure out what your vision is and what like the next best thing for your customer. Oh yeah. That that that's where stuff like journey mapping can really really help you. Is that are these good, they're good tools. Yeah, there are, there are types of research that will lead you to incremental improvements, and there are types of research that will lead you to more innovative improvements. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna tell this one story, and then I'm gonna give you like the kind of five minute overview of what I intended most of this talk to be about, and then I I will come back and do another talk on journey management next year when I will probably actually have more to say about it, which. Probably be a good thing. What's that? Oh, okay. Yeah, we can talk about that. Okay. So, um, so the types of journey maps that we've been talking about. So this one for Intuit is basically someone having a a conversation with a tax professional to help them with their taxes. And so this is what we talk about, or what we call um, a current state map. So it is helping us understand the current state of things. What is the existing experience that people are having? And we don't want to ignore, if we've got existing voice of the customer data and surveys and things like that, we don't want to ignore it. We want to use it. We can bring it into here. There's actually some data um, up here that says like 72% of all people calling in rate this as such and such. Um, you know, four out of five stars or whatever it is. So you know, we, we can use that in helping to bolster our storytelling about this, but we're still, when we come up with improvements, when we give this journey map um, you know, to our various teams, just based on how people and organizations work, they're probably gonna come up with incremental solutions here. How can we make the website a little bit better? How can we make the conversations that they're having with the sales folks a little bit better, more effective? How can we make that incremental change to the number of people going through the funnel there. Um, there's another type of journey map that is uh, called, or at least I call it the day in the life journey map. And so it's not so much focused on what customers are doing today in terms of how they're interacting with your organization. It's more about what they're doing today, period. How are they trying, how are they approaching a part of their life that's relevant to your business but who cares if they're interacting with your business or not? So uh, the example that I have from this is Philips. Um, so they, uh, Philips Healthcare, so making uh, like big MRI machines, CT scanners, that type of thing. Um, they wanted to um, understand what radiologists go through. Radiologists are not their primary buyers. So hospital administrators are the primary buyers, but the radiologists are key users of their machines and influencers of the purchase decision. So they did observational research. They followed around all these different radiologists and they came up with a journey map, a day in the life journey map. There were um, definitely parts on there where they were interacting with Philips and Philips equipment, but definitely most of the map, they were not interacting with Philips at all. And one of the things that they realized that these radiologists have to do again and again and again every single day is look at a scan and determine whether something is broken or cancerous or you know, whatever diagnosis they're trying to make. And these are not black and white decisions, there's lots of gray area, and you know, this is why they go to medical school for years to be able to do this, um, but even as trained professionals, it's difficult. And um, what they realized through just understanding, here is a pain point in these radiologists' jobs, just things they have to do every single day, they said, you know what? We actually have 
zillions of scans, because we keep all the scans that our customers, uh, our clients are, are, are creating every day, um, and we know from you know, patient outcomes, which ones are broken, which ones are cancerous, which ones are benign, which ones have whatever XYZ diagnosis. And they were able to create an entirely new service based on existing assets to sell those known benchmark scans to radiologists to help them with um, their, their jobs at, at a day to day. So, you know, depending on, it's, it's essentially the same type of research, getting, getting your customers to tell you their stories. It's really just a matter of how much are you focusing on existing interactions with your organization versus what's that? What are their new interactions? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Looking for places where interactions don't exist today. You're just going out and saying like, you know, how do you go shopping for clothes? Or how do you book travel or decide on where to go on vacation? Or how do you do your job every day? Um, and looking for those places where you know, you're waiting and wondering, right? Like nothing's happening, there's no interaction with the company there. Where can we fill in some of that white space? Yeah? Uh, you talk about scale, started with doing a scale, I think these two were exactly, they, they used to call it the same thing, the waiting life, mm -hmm. and it's all about waiting. And I think that uh, one of the journeys, or they didn't call it journeys, but some of the changes that were made were with respect to the life, because radiologists, they work uh, with most of the life switched off, and then they had to see the images in a particular light. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to know what light uh, affects their eyes, uh, you know, which is the best thing, uh -huh. which is the best color that they can see. Yeah. And they did a lot of research on that and then they came up uh, with a new color scheme mm -hmm. and just based on that research. Yeah. Yeah. There's also great research from GE Healthcare around um, uh, designing a great experience for kids who have to go in and get uh, yeah, the event of the guy, yeah, fantastic. So, anyway, um, all right, let me see. I know we've got, what, five minutes left? Yeah, five minutes left. Okay, so, um, what's that? Yeah, so um, uh, I was going to take us through an entire history of the um, Industrial Revolution, but I won't do that. <laughs> um, what I do, what I do want to say is that when, you know, when we think about the customer journey, um, you know, there's all of these individual touch points that uh, your customers are interacting with. Um, and this may look like a, a mountain range here, and I've designed it to look a little bit like a mountain range, um, but in reality, uh, this is an iceberg. And uh, there are lots of things that happen below the waterline, out of sight of the customers. They don't know that this is happening. They don't have any visibility into it. Um, things that are impacting that customer journey. Um, and so this is really where journey management um, stems from. Helping the organization realign itself around the customer journey to make sure that what is being delivered is what was designed or envisioned in the first place. So going back to that initial definition that I shared of customer experience, it's the design and management of customer interactions. And so this is kind of the, the picture of that. We've got to design the customer journey, and then we've got to, in some ways, design and manage the organization that's required to support it. So industrial revolution, Curtis and Bill Taylor, ball bearing silos. Um, and essentially the idea is that um, journeys are really the only thing that I see in organizations that cross silos consistently. Uh, they cross channels, they cross departments and functions, um, they, they cross business units, um, and so, so journeys are, I think, really um, an exciting and still undertapped way to Again, bring multiple parts of the organization together and uh, and create a profitable experience, one that really um, that delivers on the promise that we saw when we were looking at the, uh, the financial picture earlier. So, um, so I've been thinking about this in terms of product management. You know, how is this role different from product management? How is it similar to product management? One way that it's different is that. There's a lot more of you than there are of them. 
So this data is from, a, I think two months ago, I, I, took, I took these numbers uh, down in October. Um, I've actually, this is only my second time doing this speech. Um, I, I delivered this at the Service Design Network conference um, uh, a few months ago. Um, but uh, at the time, so there were about 1.3, uh, 1.4 million product managers. Um, if you did a search for, quote, product manager on LinkedIn, these are people results. Uh, if you do a search for journey managers, anyone want to guess how many there are? 1,400. Are you kidding me? Just pulled it out of the air. Oh, yes. Wow. <laughs> how are you correct? You know what? I'm using your copy of my book. There you go. about they're um, responsible they're, they're based mostly in the Middle East and somewhat in, in Africa and they are responsible for the physical journey of very precious materials from point A to point B um, so so it's not even as many as, as it appears to be here um, uh, this does represent a 20% year-over-year -year growth so I started tracking this um, about a year ago um, so uh, so, so I'm, I'm very interested to see this. Um, there's a lot of uh, big companies that are hiring journey managers. Um, so what I did is I, I, uh, uh, I didn't do this myself. I, I hired someone to dig into over 400 of these profiles in LinkedIn and um, found some interesting things about the different industries. Not surprising, banking, financial services, telecom, um, some of the, the top industries that are hiring. Um, in terms of locations, 48% um, hail from the UK. Um, so I, I'm probably gonna be spending some time uh, overseas next year um, to be talking with these organizations. One thing that I think is really interesting is that Belgium and the United States have the same number of journey managers. The United States, I mean, first of all, Silicon Valley, I mean, one of the world's you know, leading uh, countries in terms of um, industry trends. Uh, we have 29 uh, times the population of Belgium, and yet we have the same number of, of journey managers. Um, uh, so again, not surprisingly, with that data, most of them are in Europe. Um, sadly, none of them are in Antarctica. Um, so the penguins there are, are very sad. Um, I'm not going to spend uh, time uh, really going through this too much. Um, I'm going to give you a link, as I said, um, that will um, uh, you'll be able to download these slides. Um, but again, uh, I, I would love to come back and talk to you more about this or, or go to Product Camp or something. Um, but one thing that I, that I do think is really interesting, so how many of you have another role aside from being a product manager? Yeah, one, right? One? Yeah, so right now 40% of journey managers have concurrent roles. And this is similar to what we saw happening with other uh, customer experience roles. Um, it started out with like, oh yeah, can you just run the survey for us? And then they're like, oh, well it turns out we need a team of 20 people running the survey, right? So I think this is gonna change, um, but I think it speaks to the infancy of this um, uh, role right now in comparison to a field like yours that, that truly is um, established. Um, again, I'm gonna kind of blow through this. Um, the one thing that I wanna show you just at the end of this, and, and again, I'm not gonna go through this, um, but sample job descriptions, uh, and then some of the key responsibilities around strategy, agile and lean, collaboration, uh, measurement um, that these folks are responsible for. So this is what I was, um, I, I'm thrilled with the conversation we had. I, I hope I um, shared a lot with you and, and it was valuable for you. I know I learned a lot just from the type of questions you were asking. Um, and, and I really, I want, uh, as again, as I'm pivoting what uh, my own business is focusing on, I really want to be the go-to resource for everything related to journey uh, management over the next few years. Um, and so I, I wanna thank you for that, but I'd love to come back and have a conversation with you about where some of these roles um, and responsibilities of journey managers overlap with, with what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, where it doesn't overlap, where it seems really foreign, um, where you feel that journey managers might be invading your turf, or <laughs> um, uh, where you're happy to hand things off to them. 
Um, but this is a picture I'd love to leave you with and uh, just thinking about uh, designing and, and managing journeys. And with that, as promised, um, uh, so the, the data that I shared um, for the, all, the, all the LinkedIn uh, uh, bar graphs and all of that, that's in a report that you can find at carrybody.com slash journeymanagers18. And then the slides are at carrybody.com slash svpma18. Um, so please feel free to download those. And um, like I said, I would love to talk to any of you who have done journey mapping in the past and would be um, willing to, to spend 30, 60 minutes with me on the phone and help me understand where you find them valuable, where you don't find them valuable for the work that you're doing today. Um, I'd really appreciate it because I am working on my next book now and it's all about that. One last question? So, I didn't quite get it response. Yeah, sorry, that's because I went through them in about 10 seconds. Um, so, so the journey manager is essentially someone, so, so if, you, if you kind of get the idea of the customer journey um, as, um, let's say, a customer journey of onboarding, there might be someone in an organization who is responsible for that onboarding customer journey. And they might be responsible for onboarding for all of the different customer profiles, um, you know, or personas or segments that have to go through onboarding. And then you might have another um, person who is responsible for the renewal journey or, or something like that. So it's the way that I have been talking about it for the last year or so is that it's very similar to a product manager, um, or at least again my understanding of a product manager, where they are like understanding the competition understanding um, the business opportunity, setting the vision for it, needing to rally people around that vision and get people working towards it, working with different parts of the organization to get it executed, but essentially owning the, the, the business side of that journey. Um, and well, yeah, business and some execution, but execution is obviously spread out with a UX, uh, you said a UX manager or, or a UX designer. Yeah. I, from my perspective, so I used to be a UX designer. Excuse me, and um, and I don't believe, and I and I keep testing the waters with this to make sure I'm just not out of touch with it. But I spoke at a UX conference um, in London just earlier this year, and it seems that UX designers are still really just focused on one channel or another. Um, and so for me, the channel, like any website, any mobile app, whatever it is. Um, it's just one part of an onboarding journey or a renewal journey or, or whatever it is. So the, the UX journey that, or the UX uh, designer has to work with the product manager, has to work with the journey manager. Like it's all part of this ecosystem, but, but the, the focus of which each one is working on is different. Cool. Thank you so much, Gary. I really appreciate that. Yeah.